collect your verdict. Give us the answer. Uh, start with your decision to become a lawyer. Well, actually, there wasn't a firm decision to take it. Uh, almost happened by accident. Um, I grew up in Calcutta, uh, studied, born, brought up in Calcutta. And at the point, um, there was no family background in the law. And I remember I had a friend who had gone to this lovely new institution in Bangalore, uh, National Law School of India University, as we called it then. Um, and he said, look, you know, the college seems fun. Bangalore was even more fun. So why not spend five fun years away from Calcutta, which at the point, I think, for a teenager was a good time to be out. So actually, lawyering happened purely by accident, not by design. Tell us about NLS at that time. Which, what years were these? Well, five glorious years. Fortunately, only five and not six. Some of us had to spend a little more than five years. Um, this was uh, 1990 to 1995, so it's been, well, close to 16 or 17 years now. Um, but f five very enjoyable years. And uh, that was uh, Dr. Madhavin and was... Uh, That's right. I remember we were the third batch and uh, our campus at the time was not the campus that, that you have perhaps seen this in, in NLS. Central we went to this place called Central College Campus and I remember we studied in cow sheds. We had three cow sheds because there were three batches. We occupied all the three cow sheds as we called them. And we studied there for perhaps six, six maybe eight months till our campus back in, um, in where it is now was getting ready. Uh, and our hostel was fairly close by as well, close to what was the commercial side of Bangalore, which is Brigade Road and MG Road at the time. And we had a great time because we had you know, access to Bangalore City uh, and we lived a city life, so it was great fun. Anything memorable from those years that you'd like to recount? Well, I think Bangalore for was virtually every college goer's dream. Uh, it was a beautiful city. It was quiet, but it had a lot of vibrance as well. Um, lots of greenery, lots of beer, uh, lots of fun. So it was just the ideal place to be for someone who was uh, you know, getting past his teens and into adulthood, uh, who had a little bit of money to spend, not a lot. Um, so, you know, Bangalore presented opportunities that other cities in India, perhaps like Calcutta or even Delhi, couldn't present. Um, Bombay was a very different environment. Bombay was a working person's environment. So, in many ways, Bangalore was the ideal place for someone to launch uh, his educational career in a certain sort of way. Uh, and that's exactly what happened to us. Teachers? You know, I think, uh, well, most people would go through, through university with very clear memories of faculty and teachers and early influences from faculty. I think for us, given that the legal profession itself was at a stage where it was just about to take off uh, and the law school was apparently at the time path-breaking, it was more the environment in, and the institutional environment and the, and, and, and the whole community that was building around it that was extremely exciting. So I can't say I have one, two or three major influences from faculty in my growing years in law school. Perhaps if I had to name one, I would say it was our constitutional law course that had three professors take one class, uh, three professors with very different ideologies and very different teaching styles. I think, I think that would be the one for me. Okay. So do you have a sense that uh, at that time that this was pioneering in any way while you were studying there? Well, even if I didn't have the sense, we were certainly told it was. So, you know, after a while, you, when, when you got into the university and you got into the, not, I wouldn't say the real world, but when you got into the world that mattered to you, which is the legal profession um, and other educational institutions, uh, legal educational institutions, there was certainly a recognition of National Law School in Bangalore. Although I have to say, when I went back to Calcutta for summer vacations, uh, when people asked me, you know, what, what you're studying, and I said, the law, they said, you know, why did you have to go to, all the way to Bangalore? You could have studied in, in Hazra Law College in Calcutta. And, you know, so there was always a struggle. Uh, and that struggle, I think, continued until the first two or three batches really established themselves both at the bar as well as the corporate law firm community. And there was a, there was a real recognition that there was quality emerging from the institution, quality that had not been seen before. And there was a certain vibe and energy that students from the National Law School brought. And I think it was on account of two things, two very important factors. One, the five-year course. Uh, the legal industry had not experienced lawyers who had studied the law for five years. The, 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 the programs were designed essentially around three years, which you did after graduation. So students who came out of the university after doing a five-year course felt that that's all they wanted to do. 
they, they were just very deeply keen on the law. And if you look at uh, the first three or five batches that emerged from the law school, I think about 90% of the people who ended up working in mainstream professions worked in the law. Unlike most other graduates from other law schools that studied a law program or graduated from a law program to get a graduation degree. Very different from, law, from students who went to the National Law School who went to get a legal degree and wanted to study law and wanted to work in the legal profession. So I think that energy, that enthusiasm and that sophistication came through very clearly with the community of lawyers that graduated from the law school in, in Bangalore. All right. Uh, what about other activities, extracurricular activities that were well, that's common prob That was time? probably the defining thing of NLS in Bangalore. I, I think more than, more than the legal uh, program, my greatest memories are of all the extra and co-curricular activities in all fairness. There wasn't a day on campus where we didn't have something going, whether it was a music program or it was a debate or it was a moot court or it was a sporting event. There was always something to do for someone and everyone's interests were looked after. Everyone who had some interest had something to do in college. And I think that really developed people's personalities very well as well. Uh, and you can find that. You can find that people who graduated, say for example, from the first 10 batches, people who you know, found time to do things other than academia, uh, have very diverse personalities and interests. And you'll, you'll see that in the community of, of graduates from law school from, from my vintage. What did you do immediately after graduation? Well, I, um, I was one of the first few batches that had the good fortune of experiencing campus recruitment. And I found a job with Arthur Anderson. You know, most of your audience uh, perhaps doesn't even know that an institution called Arthur Anderson ever existed because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, I spent approximately three years with Andersons. And then I moved to a very small boutique firm for a couple of years. And that, in fact, was the defining point of my career when I sort of decided to start try legal with a group of other people. What was the nature of your work at Anderson's? Well, it was largely corporate work. Anderson was very much uh, a global franchise doing multinational, um, multinational type uh, consultancy service in India. So whether it was tax services or accounting services or audit services, or it was legal services. The, the legal department was part of the tax department at the time. And I recollect very clearly that uh, you always felt like you were a support function to, a, to an organization that had a larger, more core purpose around it. Um, and that was perhaps one of the reasons why I decided to leave Anderson as well. You know, as a lawyer, you, you, know, you, you have a certain kind of ego that you, you want to maintain. You want to be um, primarily a lawyer and not a support function to someone else. Um, and that's kind of the reason that I wanted to leave Anderson and start something on my own. What was the name of this boutique firm? It was called Lexend. Uh, and I spent a couple of years there, you know, happy enough years, but I had a deep desire and feeling that uh, this is not going to be forever. And uh, the legal market needed a change. It needed some freshness. It needed some professionalism. And I think that, that that void needed to be filled in India at the time. And that was what brought the five of us who started Tri-Legal together. We all had the same feeling and we all had the same vision. And that's kind of what gave birth to Tri-Legal. If you had to articulate precisely what this gap was in the legal market? Well, the legal profession was very owner-manager driven. It was very promoter driven. It was very family driven. And when you have I, well, it, in all fairness, it was not the only market that, that was owner or family driven. There were some other markets in, in Asia that had a similar dynamic. I think Korea was one of them. Japan was for a long time one of them. Um, but when, when you have a family structure in place that dominates the profession, then you have a certain kind of work ethos and a certain kind of management style that permeates through the service delivery, which is that a, you have a feeling that there isn't going to be competition in the future because you're not developing your ranks from within. Uh, you make sure that the ownership structure stays in the way it is forever. As a result of which, you don't, um, you don't incentivize people to get better uh, and to grow and to learn and to do something on their own. So it was not an entrepreneurial environment, a true entrepreneurial environment in that sense. Very much like what corporate India was in the in the early 70s and 80s until we had liberalization. 
in many ways it continues to be that now because the legal market is still closed. But you can see the signs of change. There has been a lot of fragmentation in the last 10 years in the legal profession. Uh, young lawyers, qualified lawyers, sophisticated lawyers who believe that they have the skill sets to do something on their own, don't believe that they have a sense of ownership within their organization and tend to move away and start their own law firms. But the market is not sophisticated enough for that to become the rule. I think the, the family-owned structure is still very much around. What we need is, is a sense of urgency around the liberalization discussion for this market to open up and perhaps give way to a lot of pent-up entrepreneurial spirit that's within us as, as, a, as, a, as a group of lawyers. Uh, that's what we're trying to do in Tri Legal, but I think the movement needs to be much larger than that. Okay. Who were the five of you? Well, there was um, Sridhar Gorthi, who's one of my partners and one of my closest friends here in Bombay. Uh, Rahul Mathan, I'm talking about the people who were from, from National Law School. There was Prem Ayappa, uh, Akshay Jaitley, uh, Anand Prasad. So there's five of us that, and we are all five still together. Uh, but there are so many more of us now. And, you know, we like to believe that this organization is clearly not about the five of us. In fact, it's, it's much beyond, and that's exactly what we wanted out of Trilegal. Early days of Trilegal, how? Struggle. Absolute unqualified struggle. Um, let me just share with you some, some of our early days. We, when we started in Trilegal, uh, well, we had no capital. So we had to have clients very early on in our lives to be able to support uh, office infrastructure and, and salaries. And I remember we were in this extremely small little office in Nariman Point, all of 500 square feet, three rooms uh, and a small little pantry and a small little reception. Um, and I remember, um, you know, we had a client walk in one day and uh, we didn't want to, you know, expose the size of the office to the client lest he run away thinking that this is not a law firm that he wanted to deal with. So we walked him down, we closed a few doors and we walked him down and we said, you know, this is one of our conference rooms, this is another one of our rooms and on the left, we have seating space for associates, and the left was actually just the pantry. Um, but you know, we had to live through that entire phase of insecurity uh, of where the next client would come from, where the next bill would get paid, hopefully there'd be enough money to pay taxes and all of those sorts of things. And I remember very often we wouldn't take salaries to make sure that we paid staff and associates. Um, and at every stage, there was a deep desire to reinvest in the firm both for infrastructure and technology and people. And that, I think, investment has paid off in a very significant way because it's really defined our sense of growth of the platform, uh, growth of the institution, growth of the franchise into being something totally distinct from, from its founders. So the first office was in Nariman Point? The first office was in Nariman Point. The second office was in Nariman Point. The third office was in Lower Perel, the fourth office was in Worley, and the fifth office is where we are in One India Bulls. Uh, we kept moving every three years. And simultaneously you had offices in Delhi and Bangalore? We, well, we started in Bombay, Delhi and Bangalore. And, you know, many people ask us what the origin of the name Trilegal is. And I confess that it's, a, it's, it's not the most exciting or innovative name that, that you could come up for a law firm. But we started in three places. Uh, we didn't want our names on the masthead because we were trying to create something that was distinct from its personality. That was part of our identity was to not have an identity of, it, of our founders, of us founders. And, and therefore we chose a neutral name. And as it turns out, much of the market is following that trend and creating names for law firms that dissociate themselves from their founders to give the feeling that the, that the firm is, is not about individuals, it's about the institution. What, early on, what would you categorize, characterize as a turning point? Uh, well, for the firm or? For the firm and individually? Well, I think for, for me individually, my turning point was before Trilegal. It was the reason to, to start Trilegal. It was a point in time in my career where I felt uh, a bit alone, a bit disenfranchised, um, and having a deep feeling that I've got to do something that's a game changer. Um, so I felt at a certain point when I was, I think, four years into my career, I remember handling one particular client uh, all by myself with no partner supervision because there wasn't a partner around. 
Uh, and at the end of the transaction, I said to myself, hey, I, th I think I can do this now by myself. Perhaps foolish, but I th at the time, you know, it was uh, youthful exuberance and it was fun. It, was, it sounded exciting. And there was a market waiting there to be addressed. I think that was my turning point in my fourth year of my career. I think for the firm, the turning point was perhaps four, maybe five years. I think every year was in a sense a turning point. But if there was one turning point in tri-legal, it was perhaps when you were four or five years into uh, uh, the, the launch of the firm. And I say four or five years because we started to get recognition in the wider market. Not, well, our recognition in the early days actually came in the international market. But by our fifth year, we started to get recognition in the local market. And that's when you start to get, to, to take, to, to get taken seriously by, uh, by the world around you. And by the world around you, I mean by peers, by seniors, by students, and of course, by clients. So it's, it's then that we realize that we've got recognition to a point where we can truly scale this. Uh, and I think from then on, we started to do things towards um, institution building, truly. Why do you say the early rec recognition came from the international market? Well, the, in the, the homegrown market, A, from the service delivery standpoint, was, as you know, family-oriented and driven. But interestingly enough, corporate India was also family-owned. Much of corporate India is even today family-owned, although the, the, the family structures have dramatically broken down given the, both the depth of the public markets as well as what private equity has done in the last 10 years. But what, what entrepreneurs, what families identified with was, was the trusted advisor from the family law firm. Um, and therefore, uh, that, that, that dynamic was, was very, very difficult to break into in the early years. Um, by the fifth or sixth year, corporate India that was not family driven started to recognize us. And once we got a greater awareness through to the local market, we could get deeper into you know, boardroom relationships, which is really the game to play with the Indian corporates. Um, and now, if I may say, I think uh, uh, w while we don't have the position, the aspirational position that we want, I think that we're still a few years away from that. I think we're in a position where we can uh, clearly say that uh, we are recognized very well by corporate India. What's the structure of the firm right now in terms of practice areas? Well, I think it's no different from any other large firm in the country. There are, you know, five, maybe six key practice areas. Uh, there's the corporate practice area, which would uh, uh, take within its fold uh, corporate M&A and private equity, uh, as people know it. Uh, there'd be banking and finance, which does, you know, traditional forms of banking, but also restructuring related work and covers the entire universe of financial institutions, including regulatory related work. Uh, litigation, dispute resolution generally, whether it's litigation or arbitration, is a, is a fairly significant practice. Capital markets. Uh, interestingly enough, um, employment. We're probably the only firm that has a dedicated employment practice because we feel that uh, the market is developing. In a certain way, we're actually developing the market. And we believe that, like most other developed markets, uh, developed legal markets, uh, the employment law would as you have more multinationals coming in, as you have more awareness of, of, uh, of employee rights and, and, and disputes with employees get a little more sophisticated, you will find that multinational corporations will find the need to get very sophisticated advice in, in employment law. And that's the market we're trying to fulfill. Um, we also have uh, a, a very fine technology, media and telecoms practice, which, which while falls into some level into a larger corporate practice, but has a unique and distinct place of its own in the firm. Right. And um, do the offices in Bangalore, Delhi and Bombay still lead? The, are they still the flagship offices? We now have an office in Hyderabad as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a relatively new office. Um, we hired a partner to lead the office about eight months ago. Uh, we're pleased with its uh, development. I think the Hyderabad market is where Bangalore was 10 years ago so in terms of finding the right level of talent pool and sophisticated client base that needs legal services to be, to be executed or serviced from within Hyderabad is yet to develop. So we're going to grow that office 
uh, in a way that supports that development. Uh, and we don't think that it can be, you know, a 50 lawyer office in the next two years. But uh, we are very committed to that market and we, we believe there's a lot of untapped potential there. Uh, so that's our fourth office. Whether we'll have a fifth or a sixth office, I think, you know, time will tell. At the, mom at the moment, we don't have any plans to launch any new offices. Right. And uh, in your opinion, is there a uniform culture across all offices? Well, we would like to believe there is a uniform culture. We worked very hard at establishing what we believe is a tri-legal DNA. And that is a unique selling point for the firm. It's what people, it's what the graduates in the recruitment program seek out as well. We are, we are, we are a very exciting prospect, if I may say, uh, at, uh, on campus. People think of us uh, as an exciting firm, as a young firm, but also an extremely transparent and performance-driven and, and merit-based firm, which is extremely important given the, the dynamic that lawyers have lived through, lawyers of my generation have lived through in the last 16 or 17 years is something that we protect very fiercely. It's something that we don't compromise on. And I think that's, it, it, it helps for us, not just at the graduate level, but across every level to, to be able to, to be in a position to hire the, the best talent in the market. And uh, specifically, what measures are being taken to attract the best talent and also retain the best talent? Well, uh, there are no measures. Uh, well, th some measures were taken in the early years, which is that we must be transparent. We must be flat. You know, every part, there isn't an ecosystem of, of partners, other power brokers and the rest of the people have to sort of fall in line. It's a very inclusive environment. It's an environment that encourages discussion and debate. It's an environment that promotes talent, that rewards talent. But most, most recently, I think in the last few years, the one, if I had to talk about one single measure that we took that really changed uh, both public perception as well as oriented ourselves to who we want to be as a firm was a profit sharing model. And while that's a model that is uh, most impacts partners' lives in the firm, but at a, at a very fundamental level, it affects associates' lives because they look up to that and they see that this is where they want to be one day. So it creates an aspiration within the young associates. Our lockstep model is unique in the sense that it is the only firm in the country that pools its entire profit for distribution with the partnership, with a larger partnership. Uh, we don't have uh, a concept of a founder partner in a partnership deed. And that's a very important dynamic in the firm because it, it, it permeates every aspect of our policy and decision making. Um, so for example, we have a retirement age for every partner, uh, whether you're a founder partner or not, because there isn't a recognition of a founder partner as being distinct from a non-founder partner. Um, everyone retires at the retirement age, the units, the unit profit, the, the profit units go back into the pool for distribution amongst the rest of the partnership. Uh, there's no succession. So we've really tried to address every element of family and personality and, and, and uh, structures that reward one set of people and not the larger partnership um, into creating a firm that, that people believe is, is purely merit-based and purely transparent, fully transparent. Having become quite a big firm, uh, are there challenges that this model is facing? Well, I think uh, every partnership, well, I, I'm only qualified to talk about law firms, but I can tell you from my experiences that it, it impacts every partnership. Well, perhaps any organization in the world, I think every profit sharing model has its challenges. Um, we're still uh, in the early days of evolution on these models in India. And I think we will face challenges. I think what people have, have spoken widely about lockstep models the world over is the ability to retain your, your, your best talent or, your, or your, as they called in any system, your superstars and your ability to get rid of slackers because the lockstep model in a certain sense uh, doesn't reward you based on the revenue that you bring. But if I may say, I think we've, you know, we've done a lot of thinking and soul searching on this system and what we believe works for us for now is the fact that the lockstep incentivizes institutional behavior. It, it, it orients your thinking towards the firm and not the individual, unlike the eat what you kill model, which essentially rewards in individuals for what they do for themselves. In a lockstep model, and I believe clients benefit greatly from a lockstep model because in a lockstep model, the, 
the partner with the right skill set will perform the right task. And therefore, individuals look for the interest of the larger firm. So it really does promote institutional behavior. I think you have to keep a close eye on how the lockstep performs for the firm. I think if, if the firm doesn't do well and you have, you, know, you have slackers in the system or you have pe people who you think are taking undue advantage of the system, then you have to find a way of addressing that. Uh, but that's not reason enough to not have a lockstep. If a lockstep works well, it works extremely well. And we believe that we have both the right set of people as well as the as well as the right system to make this work well for us. I'm not saying that it would work well for everyone in every environment, but we believe it works well for us. Let's talk about the uh, the best friends relationships that you relationship that you entered into a couple of years ago now. Well, it uh, we just renewed our our, our relationship with Alan Overy uh, a few months back, and we're now in we just finished three years. Uh, this January we finished three years. Okay. What were the motivations behind it? Well, I think at the time, uh, what, what, the, what people in the market thought was that this was the motivation was to, you know, to, to merge with ANO. Um, and I can say that, uh, you know, the, the markets weren't even close to opening up at the time that we signed our, uh, our, our, our signed up for our relationship with ANO. Um, and, and the other thing that people could think of our relationship, I'll just talk about what, you know, what the public perception could be, but what the reality actually is is that this is about the referrals, about the business that we get from ANO. For us, it was none of that. For us, the reason, well, firstly, the firms get along, get along very well, which is why we did something together. But for the real reason for us to do something with, with ANO, with a top quality international firm, was that we wanted to be the best domestic law firm. It's not our aspiration to be the biggest domestic law firm. We want to be the best law firm that there is in India. And to be the best law firm, you have to have the best practices. And we felt that to have the best practices, we need a certain level of sophistication, which we couldn't do in a short period of time by ourselves. And we needed to have uh, an international footprint, as well as uh, the backing of an international firm to build our systems in line with international best practices. And that's what really we focused on for the last three years. I think, you know, from, from, the, from the point of view of business, if you become a better firm, you're going to get better business. So we felt that you know, the best way to attract the business was not to get the business from other law firms, but to improve yourselves to a standard, standard of quality and be a standalone practice, a standalone firm that can attract the best clients, that can attract the best people. And I think that's, that, that strategy for us is, is, is truly paying off. So obviously you found yourself uh, wanting in some respects at the time of entering into the relationships and you're hoping that uh, and you could help help you climb the well, at one goes. Absolutely. I, I think you know in 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 any growth market, India certainly was and certainly continues to be a very strong growth market. You're so focused on the delivery side that you lose sight. You don't lose sight, you don't have time for the back end. By by the back end I don't mean just the quality of your lawyers, but the quality of your support systems, the quality of your technology platform, the quality of your training, the quality of your of your know how. Uh, the quality of your um, of your finance function, for example, just to help you be more profitable. All of these things were uh, were areas where we felt we could do with some support, and that's exactly what we've done with ANO. All right. And um, look um, now, looking back three years, uh, how do you think it has worked out? Well, we extended, so it's obviously worked very well. We wouldn't have neither of us would have extended. I think it's fair to say that both sides are thrilled with the relationship. Uh, there is a certain level of trust and camaraderie and, and collegiality that exists in each of our respective firms and, ex and exists between us that makes this uh, a truly remarkable association. Uh, I, both of us feel that it's, it's, uh, we couldn't have done it with any other firm uh, and both sides feel extremely close to each other at a partnership level as well as at an organizational level. We have a lot of interaction between partners and we have a lot of interaction within the associate ranks as well. So people truly feel that, you know, uh, we work together as, as, as a very, very close association. Um, sometimes clients feel that they get the, um, the level of attention and the, and the level of service that they would get from any international firm. And there's a level of seam seamlessness to the association that's, that's very remarkable. Um, you spoke about training. Where do you think Trilegal has an upper hand 
as far as trading is concerned? Well, I think generally speaking, the market has started to see training. It didn't exist at our time. Training was very much what your senior imparted. And if he didn't impart or she didn't impart training, then you didn't, didn't get any. There was no institutional, institutionalized training. I think the market has improved for institutionalized training. I think, um, I think law firms, generally speaking, are too busy to train. So I think there are two aspects to training. One is, uh, is, there a market, is there a market for professional service providers to train lawyers? I think there's a developing market, but it's still very nascent and it's still not sophisticated enough. And there's the internal training, which is what the law firms would do for their own associates. You know, partners would get down, roll up their sleeves on a Saturday morning and order in lunch and impart training to their group of associates. Um, very much uh, not an institutional approach. It depends entirely on how much time people have. And I think we felt that, you know, that's an area that we need to focus on very strongly. It's another area that we felt we gained significantly because of association with ANO. So we do a couple of things. One, very early into an associate's life in tri-legal, we, we've adopted what we call the seat rotation system. So a lawyer, when he joins, he or she joins tri-legal, will move departments every four to six months and experience at least three departments to get a sense of what it is like to practice the law in different aspects. Um, we did this both because we felt it was important and we got feedback from the associates that it's something that they would like to do. So it's part of our whole approach to transparency and, and listening to our stakeholders on what they want. Uh, this program was launched uh, about a year ago. So it's still early days, but the feedback we get from the lawyers is that it's been very successful. Uh, the other thing that we do is, is that we second lawyers to a &O, so they get a good international experience. They get, the, they get a sense of what it is to work in an international market in a, in a large law firm. Uh, secondments run for approximately six months, uh, and they could be across various different practice areas. They're largely centered around, um, around markets and, and, and geographies that address the Indian market, and, and for a good reason. So lawyers would mostly second in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, London, Dubai, or perhaps sometimes maybe New York. Um, and a number of lawyers go every year for, for a six-month secondment training program. We also have, ANO also runs a university workshop for corporate and banking lawyers in London, which we send a number of lawyers every year to. So there's a fair amount, both time, effort, and money that we, that we spend on training. I want to ask you about uh, the frame framework in which the uh, foreign law firm question is being debated. Um, what are your thoughts on but I think if you if you if you look at it dispassionately, I think uh, the discussion and the debate happens amongst interest groups, and when I mean interest groups, I mean them in in inverted commas. I think the debate has got to be a little wider. You have got to ask all stakeholders in the market today on what their views on foreign law firms entry or or, or the liberalisation of the legal market is like. By by the larger stakeholder group, I mean. A, of course, the community of, 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 of practicing lawyers. Uh, B, the community of clients. You will find a lot of clients, both Indian as well as multinational. And this is not just multinational clients asking for their favorite law firms to be in India. When you talk to the big Indian corporates, you think of the Tatas or you think of I, you know, people like ICICI. When you talk to in-house legal departments, they would very much both like... Both uh, Pramod Rao and Ashok Gupta have told, told me the same thing. Right, exactly. There you are. Uh, they would all like international firms to be in India for the simple reason that big Indian companies are now like multinational conglomerates. They don't have interests. Well, a, a, India very much is part of a larger globalized world and therefore you have transactions and influences that require an international firm to give you the right level of service and why not have them at your doorstep rather than uh, you know in a time zone that's five hours away. Uh, and secondly, Indian corporates have aspirations of being global companies and therefore you need global expertise to feed that. Again, it would be much easier if you had that expertise uh, next door. So I think if you, if certainly associates uh, in every law firm in India uh, would want international law firms. So I think if you, if you looked at the larger uh, interest groups and the, and the stakeholders in the market, uh, it's something that's waiting to be done. It's, it's, there is a desperate need for India to liberalize. I'm not saying that we must uh, either liberalize overnight or we must liberalize in, in only a certain way. I'm saying that there needs to be a debate for 
all the voices to be heard to figure out what's best for us. There has been a lot of talk about how Indian law firms need to have a level playing field, they need to be established, they need to be given a, a lot of time to get their act together to face competition from the big boys. But look, India has been liberalized for 20 years now. Uh, big Indian corporates felt exactly the same way when India liberalized in 1991. Uh, and they have actually only benefited from liberalization. Uh, and I think the same could be said for Indian law firms. But are there changes in the regulatory environment uh, that should precede the entry economy? Well, you know, the, the change in the regulatory environment will be driven by a desire to allow this to happen in the first place. I think if there is a desire, if the interest groups and the lobby groups believe that uh, this should happen, then the regulations will change. The regulations are only a function of what people want. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, new moves from the uh, law ministry to introduce a regulator, regulator for transactional lawyers? Well, I think uh, you know, that probably requires a much larger debate. I think in a certain sort of way, uh, most professions in the world are used to being self-regulated. You already have the Bar Council, both at a national level as well as at, at a more decentralized state level to, to ensure that there is a certain standard and quality. I am not saying that that approach has worked perfectly, but you have already got an institution and a system in place. You might as well try and implement that well enough to make sure that you are regulated in the right sort of way. I am not quite sure we are ready yet for an external regulator outside of the profession to be regulating the legal profession. Sure. Fee, lawyers fees, how do law firms uh, bill clients, what are the methods you use? Well, you know, there is there's, there's no science to it, there is no magic to it. India, is a very, India has always been a very fee sensitive market. Um, in fact, in the old days, you know, lawyers would, I am not talking about litigating lawyers, but corporate lawyers would simply pick up the phone and ask their clients if they were, what sort of fee they were prepared to pay. That market is a, has obviously evolved. Look, there are many, the, traditionally there are, you know, the lawyers would like to charge uh, by the hour or by the minute or by six minutes or whatever interval suit them. Uh, but those, those structures are not uniform or consistent, not, not in India, perhaps not necessarily in, in other parts of the more developed legal world either. But if, if lawyers had their way, they would like to bill by the hour because it, it makes the business more predictable. Uh, you know exactly how many lawyers you have, you can predict the number of hours they can work. And if you charge by the hour, you could predict what the revenue cycle would be like and you would, you know, you would have a more predictable business environment. But the reality of the market is that while you will have a, a, an hourly system of billing in some cases and in some practices, equally in some practices you will have to bill a certain fixed fee. And I think that is a little more challenging because uh, the environment is, is, not, is not suitable to a fixed fee model simply because you are not in a position, no service provider is in a position to dictate specifically when and how a transaction is going to close. So very often you will find in fixed fee assignments there are cost overruns that then you have to start negotiating with clients halfway through a transaction which is never either an easy or a desirable thing to do. Uh, but the market is evolving. Um, while Indian clients have been extremely shy of paying fees in the early days, they're getting the f the appetite for fees have gone up. Um, but I have to say that the costs are rising faster than than the fees are. So in a certain sort of way, I think law firms must get used to um, having smaller margins uh, on their business, and that's 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 a factor of the market getting more sophisticated because you're having to pay higher salaries. The single largest cost for, for law firms are the salary costs and that's, and that's going to remain the case going forward as well because that's exactly what it is internationally. So, you know, margins are shrinking but I think over time law firms will find a way to address it. The client community will find a way of paying a little more fees and this market will evolve. I think, I think we're maybe 10 years away from the market getting a little more sophisticated on fees. Um, campus recruitment. Um, is there a different approach that uh, Trilegal has taken to campus recruitments? Well, I don't think there's a different approach. I think most people would uh, come to campus and uh, make a presentation and try and attract the best in class. But what we've tried to do over the last few years is to make uh, internships as a 
part of our recruitment process. Uh, and while initially internships would be a little more, um, a little less institutionalized, we try and make sure that our internship program is addressing a, a larger need to recruit the right kind of talent. Uh, we try and we try now and interview our potential uh, interns before we actually take them for our internship programs. We try and make sure that we get in as many interns in a year as we possibly can both accommodate as well as look after. Um, on campus, I think uh, we rely very, very heavily on people who, who've, who've, who work with us, who've, who've also studied in that particular college to give us the right level of, of support in our recruitment programs. Um, but yeah, I think in the last two or three years, we've gotten better, uh, a little more scientific in how we recruit people. We've started to uh, we've started to take written tests. Your uh, attitude towards internships? Oh, it's uh, something we take very seriously because that's we look at internships as uh, future associates potentially. So we make sure interns are looked after. They've got a mentor for the entirety of their stay here, and it's the job of every mentor to make sure that there's enough work for the intern. Uh, we also do a little socializing with our interns to make sure that they have fun and they go back with happy memories and stories of, of the firm. It's really the interns that build your, your visibility and your credibility back on campus. And then they come back to, you know, on the ca at, at campus recruitment time to interview with you. So I think interns are an extremely important constituency uh, and they need to be looked after well. Okay. Um, do you think firms are doing enough to uh, contribute to legal education? Well, I'm not... I'm not sure that uh, firms should be the ones that are responsible for legal education. I think educational institutions need to have the primary responsibility of the, for that. Uh, having said that, I think if I had to answer your question, I don't think that enough is being done because I don't think uh, I, I don't think the educational institutions are reaching out to to the law firms to to institutionalize this process. Uh, having said that, we have invested a lot of time and effort over the last three years, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, going forward uh, as well. We run a program together with uh, Alan Overy. Uh, it's, it's an international finance law program. And this year we're making slight changes to that program to introduce a corporate law element to it as well. And so far we've run this program at NLS in Bangalore. But we're changing this year, we're moving the program to Nalsar in Hyderabad. Um, and from the last year, and we're continuing this this year as well, we're inviting the top 10 students from the top five or six universities to participate in this program. It's a workshop that runs for a week that has partners from both Alan Overy and Tri-Legal taking courses in finance and corporate law. Uh, extremely uh, well attended. Uh, we get extremely good feedback. Uh, in fact, people write to us all the time on how they'd like to participate and wouldn't be coming next. So for us, yes, that's, it, it's a small and humble beginning to, to an institutionalized approach to, to learning uh, at educational universities. We'd like to broad base that to, not, to, to, the, to other uh, universities as well, not just the top five or six, but that requires a serious amount of time commitment. And I don't think one law firm can deliver the needs for, for an entire market. So we've made a start. We hope that uh, that will influence other, uh, you know, professionals, not just law firms, but other professionals to take to teaching a little more. Because what we lack in our educational institutions is, is the practicing lawyer's approach to the law. And that insight is very valuable. I wish I had it. But we're trying to, we're trying to influence that change. All right. Um, Another aspect to attracting the best talent is obviously, uh, you know, apart from the work culture, salaries, etc., uh, there is this thing called uh, work-life balance. Really? <laughs> I wonder what that is. Well, yes, um, we hear a lot more of that now than we have in the past. And, and in all fairness, I think the need for that has emerged even more today than it has been in the past. Uh, lawyering is an extremely stressful uh, profession. I think it's not just lawyering. I, I think. If you look at any mainstream corporate job, it's become very stressful. Um, while we do have five-day weeks with the advent of technology, I think you never really switched off 
uh, your clients are always uh, in your mind. Uh, you, you, you find the need to respond or to take care of your clients, certainly we do all the time. And there is, uh, there is more burnout in fatigue today than there was in our early years of growing up. Um, we are obviously trying to address that in a number of ways. Uh, I think the most important thing is to actually mentor young lawyers. You see the problem is not that institutions force lawyers to work hard. It is a vicious cycle. I think lawyers are much more ambitious today. Young lawyers are much more ambitious. They want to be in on more deals and they want to be doing the work but when they get that volume of work they also get very tired and they want a better work life balance. I think the idea is for both institutions is both stakeholders to take a step back and take a deep breath and figure out what is in everyone's collective best interest. I think what is in everyone's collective best interest is that lawyers are happy because happy lawyers will be good lawyers. Uh, happy lawyers will also make sure that your attrition rates are manageable. Uh, certainly the most your best lawyers will be the most overworked lawyers. So you need to make sure that your work life balance addresses that constituency and, and that is where you feel the attrition the most as well. Um, you know we try and make sure that a lawyers take their entire leave for the year. We try and make sure that if lawyers we monitor that time very carefully if lawyers are working too hard then we have a conversation with them to say look you need to tone it down a bit make sure that you take less work. We talk to partners who are working very hard to make sure that the work moves to, to other lawyers as well. I, I, I would not be brave enough to say that all of this always succeeds but certainly the attempt is there. It is a very difficult environment to make sure that there is constant work life balance for anyone for partners as well. Uh, and I think there is a there is a certain phase that we need to live through. But as long as we are conscious of it and we make sure that we make every effort to address this work life balance issue, we will get to the best possible result on achieving it. I am not saying that it will be perfect but we will get to the best possible situation. Let your verdict give us the answer.